Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass PNC. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Cass? I'm doing good. We are talking about something that I'm just kind of shocked we've never discussed at length before. I know it's come up here and there. We're going to talk about Dell Tech Bank and Trust, which is a bank out in the Bahamas. And they, they own a lot of companies throughout the Caribbean. Um, they've existed for a long time. Their history is interesting and it gets into weird conspiracy land like rather quickly. And I'm not one to buy into those conspiracies, to be quite honest. But I think even just going back to the more recent history of Dell Tech and their association with our favorite cryptocurrency in the world, Tether, USDT. I believe that there's been some level of disassociation um, more recently. I believe there's other banks that have stepped in to kind of take over the role of the main bank of Tether. But I actually think it's it's good for us to start with the actual recent history of um, Dell Tech Bank, which is that Jean Chalapin purchased this bank in the 1990s, I believe. Anyone unfamiliar with Jean Chalapin, he is not a banker at, at like, he was not a known, <laughs> he is now, but he was not known as like a banker, a finance guy, he was known as the creator of Inspector Gadget. Um, he's a French guy, creator of Inspector Gadget, and had made money via his syndication of Inspector Gadget and other cartoons, and had sold his entertainment business for a significant amount of money. I believe it had IPO'd, and then it got purchased by another company, and then he bought this bank in the Caribbean, and suddenly became a banker and a finance guy. Can we try to d dissect what Dell Tech has been up to since he took charge? For most of the time since he took charge, it seemed as though Dell Tech wasn't doing that much. They were growing somewhat slowly. They had a few billion in terms of total assets and total deposits under their management. And that seemed to be mostly true until the summer of 2018, when Tether and Bitfinex, after having been cut off from many of their other banking partners, ended up establishing a relationship with Jean Chalapin and Dell Tech Bank and Trust. And this relationship was critical for Bitfinex and Tether in this era, so much so that you see like Paulo Arduino briefly serve as a director for Dell Chain. You see uh, the Fulger Alpha, a hedge fund associated with Dell Chain, get onboarded into, onto Bitfinex in this era. And most importantly, in November 1st, 2018, Dell Tech Bank and Trust published a letter which claimed that the portfolio cash value of Tether's holdings was greater than the number of Tethers in circulation. And at the time, this was important because there was a lot of doubt about the assets Tether had, their quality, their quantity, their encumbrance. And the day after this letter was published on November 2nd, Bitfinex takes hundreds of millions of dollars out of Tether's account, continuing the incestuous relationship between these two sister firms. Dell Tech continued to serve as Tether's bank of choice for the next several years, aiding and abetting their growth to now a hundred billion dollar size. And part of the reason Dell Tech was so useful is because they were willing to also service a variety of other cryptocurrency firms. The most important one that we're going to be talking about today is Alameda Research, Sam Bankman Fried's now defunct proprietary trading desk and embezzlement machine. Alameda Research banked at Dell Tech and was also Tether's number one client. There are some allegations in a recent class action lawsuit filed in the Southern District of Florida, which provides some additional color on the relationship between Alameda Research, FTX, Dell Tech, and Tether that I think we're going to get into. But the most important thing to just understand off the jump is starting in the summer of 2018, up until probably like the collapse of Alameda Research, Dell Tech Bank and Trust made itself one of the most important banks in cryptocurrency, and they had dreams of becoming even more important. Like we talked about in our Moonstone episode, uh, Jean Chalapin went out and purchased an American bank as well, which had FTX deposits, which Alameda Research invested in, which eventually got in trouble for, you know, not telling the Federal Reserve about what they were doing and things like that. We'll get into that as well. Also go back to our last Moonstone episode. But in short, Dell Tech Bank and Trust became the preeminent cryptocurrency bank, the preeminent cryptocurrency insurer. They run their own cryptocurrency business, 
and are fundamentally tied into the operations of so many of these different firms. What I find to be really funny um, <laughs> is if you go to Dell Tech's Twitter account right now, the last tweet, the la I guess it's a retweet, the last thing that they've tweeted out essentially is from the Nassau Guardian, Nassau being the capital of the Bahamas. So this is one of the newspapers in the Bahamas and they are reporting in November of 2022 that Dell Tech Bank and Trust one of the largest financial institutions in the Bahamas, said in a statement on its website last week that it has no credit or asset exposure to collapsed cryptocurrency exchange FTX. So it's just kind of lovely um, to be reminded how this bank, just the last thing they even publicly have really done was say that they had nothing to do with FTX, nothing to do with Sam Bankman-Fried, and now we're finding out um, just over a year later that they uh, definitely had a lot to do with them. Yeah, I think we should talk a little bit about what that relationship looked like. Our friend Gregory Pepin, the former deputy CEO of Dell Tech Bank and Trust, was the primary point of contact for FTX and Alameda Research, according to the allegations in this complaint, which are based on thousands of text messages Carolyn Ellison shared as part of her settlement to get out of this class action lawsuit. There's a lot of allegations in those text messages and in those lawsuits, including that, like, Dell Tech at one point got questions from, I think it was Citibank, about what the FTX and Alameda Research accounts was doing, and Greg Pepin just handed those questions over to Alameda Research, and then, like, offered to populate invoices for them to explain why certain deposits and withdrawals were coming in and out of the accounts. And the other thing to remember is that this was basically an entirely manual process. Dell Tech wanted to be able to offer intra-account settlement like Signature and Silvergate could, where you could easily move funds between accounts at the same bank really quickly. But instead of developing a technological solution that enabled that, they put Greg in charge of it and had people text Greg when they wanted to move money. And so every so often they would need to reconcile these various wires coming like into the Alameda research account that were supposed to be attributed to FTX or funds at FTX that were, you know, many hundreds of millions of dollars that needed to get moved over to the Alameda research account for totally legitimate reasons. And so when this would happen, our friend Greg Pepin would hop in a Telegram chat he had with a bunch of Alameda Research and FTX executives and declare that it was money time. And when it was money time, Greg Pepin would ask the executives at Alameda Research and FTX to explain which of these wires that were coming into the same accounts were meant to go to FTX and which ones were meant to go to Alameda Research. And he would even sometimes joke about how he was going above and beyond to provide this service, saying things like, what, Silvergate doesn't work at 10.38 p.m. and postpone their evening movies to review wires? And yeah, of course they don't, Greg. Of course they don't. Overall, uh, the allegations talk about how Dell Tech was instrumental in the physical movement of the funds from FTX to Alameda Research and also offered other special privileges to Alameda Research as it pertains to Tether that we'll get into. But like, just at the most basic, Greg Pepin was hopping into a Telegram chat, shouting it was money time, and then helping move customer funds from FTX to Alameda Research. Allegedly, of course, Greg. Allegedly. Don't worry. So I don't usually talk about our tweets with these people because it's kind of like whatever but as you said so i'm i'm reading the protos article about this and it says um pepin wanted to vouch for alameda publicly at one point stating there's people coming to me about alameda insolvency shit i'm pushing back and say it's bs however seems to grow a bit those fud are you okay if i come out more publicly attacking people on Twitter when I see and divert attention with, pe with people ping me. By the way, there's some additions in there from, uh, from Protoss. But I'm just thinking about how we, I tweeted out about this in November of 2022. And I said, has anyone had an opportunity to speak to the lads at Dell Tech Bank? How are they holding up? And Kyle, <laughs> buddy of ours, Kyle, screenshotted Greg saying FUD stages for dummies. 
Some people asked me if they were any worry about FTX. My regular tweets are sufficient to show I have zero concern. Um, and that this guy then goes on to say, why are you pinging me in this thread? I believe FTX was solvent like the overwhelming majority of the industry. And I was wrong and I admit I was wrong and didn't shy away from admitting tons of people lost money by depositing funds with them, me included. Not sure what is funny here or amusing to poke. And I asked him, what kind of exposure did Dell Tech and Dell Chain have? And he said, that's been answered and that there's been no impact, no exposure from this event. And I think that's just like patently false. I also want to talk about the reporting from Coindesk leading up to all this made it pretty abundantly clear that Alameda Research was insolvent. Like taking the balance sheets that Coindesk was reviewing at that point Alameda Research was valuing assets at more than the entire market cap for those assets at that time. There was evidence just in that that Alameda Research was insolvent. Yet Greg, the deputy CEO of a bank with many billions of dollars under their management, looked at that and said, this is clearly FUD. Yeah. Not to say Greg is, you know, not qualified for his job or anything, but, you know, Maybe Greg should have read the articles before calling it FUD. I mean, I, I just hope he's not doing due diligence for Dell Tech um, because speaking, that's the due diligence. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but speaking of his tweets in this era when FTX was declaring bankruptcy, my personal favorite from Greg was November 12th when he says, question for bankruptcy specialist, is there any precedent of bankruptcy that would involve so many companies and more important, so many creditors spread all over the world as here we are likely dealing with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of FTX users as creditors? Uh, he, he, he didn't have a good handle on this situation while he was actively defending FTX and Alameda Research. Yeah, well, he's certainly disappeared uh, since this lawsuit um, made some waves. So uh, he gets quiet whenever these situations present themselves. Well, and, and he's been quiet kind of since the failure of Moonstone and like the distancing of the, what was it, Innovative Financial Services Group or whatever that was supposed to do like the digital banking tied to Moonstone that he was connected to. And now he's spending most of his time over at, what's it, Theravectus, the biotech company or whatever that he's connected yeah. to. Look, not we shouldn't. Important. We don't need. What we Greg don't need is to get to it. Is not the point of this lawsuit. <laughs> not at all. And but I but I do think that it's it's certainly interesting that it has caused a chilling effect on uh, the normally loud folks over there at Dell Tech. Um, and and I do think that a lot of these simple back and forths that you mention, I guess, regardless of how the lawsuit turns out, you know. Like, we do have some evidence here that these guys, they were working together in a very, very, very cushy relationship, right? Especially for bankers and their clients. It's not necessarily how you would expect them to be behaving. Feels inappropriately intimate. That's right. But maybe we're just not, we, we don't, we're not dealing with billions of dollars. Perhaps that is how billions of dollars yeah. are handled at banks. I have no idea. Our, our bankers don't care about us because we're thousandaires. <laughs> we, I think we should also talk about the allegations about the line of credit that as it was related to Tether and Alameda Research. The lawsuit alleges that Alameda Research was able to consistently sell Tethers for more than a dollar. We've hinted a little bit at this podcast before on what some of those activities likely were. Uh, capital flight and money laundering and things like that. We've talked about uh, Sam Bankman Fried's ownership of other trading desks like Genesis Block and Hivex and how that was important for moving the funds, but also in terms of opening up markets where they could reliably sell tethers. And so because Deltac recognized that Alameda Research was able to sell these tethers into these markets, they started extending an effective revolving line of credit to Alameda Research, where Alameda Research could uh, have Dell Tech basically transfer money they didn't have yet over to Tether. They would get the Tethers, they would sell the Tethers, and then they would return the funds they got from selling the Tethers to Dell Tech, who would then return them to... Uh, and everyone's got their money at that point then. At some points, this line of credit seemed to exceed $2 billion borrowed was tracked kind of manually, seemingly, and um, this specific arrangement 
likely tied to the Fiat integration agreement that Alameda Research has with iFinix, which occurred at almost exactly the same time, seems to correspond with Alameda Research just ballooning in terms of the total number of tethers they issued and their like importance as this like tether client. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that suggests that Deltek had this very critical role in enabling Alameda Research to become this massive tether client. And I want to actually like this does touch on something that our, our last um, episode about Tether getting essentially to a hundred billion dollar market cap, whatever we want to call it. But this goes back to this idea of people saying, ha ha, see, there's nothing wrong with Tether. I told you so. And being able to point to evidence like hard evidence saying, no, actually, you know what the truth was, was that they were utilizing tethers exactly the way people have been claiming for a long time which goes back to things like being unable to get an audit because of this where if you are handing out loans with money that you don't have to buy assets and then quickly arbitrage those assets and make money on it so that you're now backing the funds that you call the loans back into that like there is something deeply wrong with that. There's something deeply, deeply wrong with that picture. And that is actually the picture we're seeing painted here. Like, it is undeniable that this is the kind of stuff that was happening, at least at certain given points in time, in Tether's history, in FTX's history, in Bitfinex's history. And what's particularly interesting to me is how this seems to be almost a formalizing of a pre-existing Tether arrangement. If we go back to the CFTC settlement between with Tether, they talk about how Tether at times was backed by anticipated wire transfers. So Tether would send you the tethers before they actually got the money because they knew you were going to send it on Monday, right? As soon as you could get to the bank, you were going to send that money. So they would give you the tethers beforehand. The famous this, weekend wires. <laughs> yes. What this is is basically that same thing, except Tether is now smart enough to keep themselves from being the entity like that's directly extending the credit. They had Deltek effectively stand in as the middleman and extend that same revolving line of credit against the anticipated wire transfers. But now Tether itself is getting the money from Deltek into their account immediately. And so what's interesting to me is that it's that same pattern that they've been doing since, let's say, 2018, 2017, whatever. But now they've added this like bank, this seemingly semi-legitimate institution in the middle of these arrangements that have existed for most of Tether's existence. I think there's some unfortunate things that people need to realize. And and I think you and I realized this probably a lot sooner than other people, which is so um, before Tether started banking with Deltek, one of the banking partners they had, I, I shouldn't even call it a bank because it wasn't a bank. It was what's called an international financial entity called Noble Bank. That was the name of this IFE. And that was their partner that they were relying on, apparently, according to Blo Bloomberg reporting, I believe, um, or maybe it was Zeke Fox in his book, apparently John Betts, the, the guy who created Noble Bank, decided to shut it down after Giancarlo Devasini wanted to do riskier things with these assets that were being held in at Noble. Giancarlo being the CFO of um, Tether and Bitfinex. So that's when they m made their move to Deltek. But I think that's when we realized, especially after Noble immediately shut down thereafter, that this is like such a bigger problem than one bank. Like even if Deltek, I, this is a, as far as I can recall, this is a civil case that's being brought against them. Yes. Am I, am I right? Yeah, about it's a that? class yeah. action so lawsuit. Class action lawsuit. It's a civil suit. You never know that could lead to other action possibly, but I'm not holding my breath. I see, I see you there, but hold on. Let me just continue here for a second in that. I think this is similar to other things where regardless of how this, this civil suit turns out, I do think that you have a tarnished reputation a bit for this bank, unfortunately, you know, Jean Chalpin helped uh, craft the D.A.R.E. Act in the Bahamas, which helped make it a welcoming place for FTX and SBF, which helped kind of lead it to being the center of where this fraud was being committed. Um, so so I do think that on the island and outside of the island now, you know, this is in my opinion, but it seems like you have a bit of a tarnished reputation for this bank. and. Tether had long ago already moved on to CUB, a Capital Union Bank. And Ansbacher and 
et cetera, et cetera, down the line. And who knows? Who even they, knows what, the, what they are? They've got a couple of other we know of. But. Yeah. And there's probably new ones that they're trying to work with every single day. But that in turn is part of the issue, right? Is that there's likely, I don't know, thousands of these banks, not just in the Caribbean. We're talking about in Eastern Europe, in Asia, in, I, I'm sure in America, community banks, stuff like that. There, and bigger banks too. I'm not going to yeah, deny that. Uh, or HSBC, the likes of them. Um, you have banks and money movers who are more than willing to work with these people, regardless of how weird and possibly illegal the transactions may be that are tra that are occurring. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to call what Dell Tech was doing for FTX and Tether illegal, but it sure stinks. Speaking of weird and possibly illegal transactions, the lawsuit mentioned that Alameda's transactions with Bitfinex and Tether would first flow through Dell Tech Bank's account and Mitsubishi UFJ Trust and Banking Corporation, a Japanese bank. And the lawsuit also mentioned that U.S. authorities seized funds from there in June, which sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole until I discovered a June affidavit, which supported the seizure of Dell Tech Bank funds held at Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi UFJ Trust and Banking Corporation, related to an investigation into wire fraud, bank fraud, and money laundering. And what makes this really interesting is that it seems Dell Tech opened what was supposed to be a custodial account at MUFG, but... The affidavit suggested Dell Tech has allowed the account to be used by other third parties in activity mm. that would not reasonably be anticipated in a custody account, and that has allowed individuals to avoid the scrutiny and vetting that international transactions might otherwise receive. This affidavit in specific does not mention FTX, does not mention Alameda Research, does not mention Tether, does mention... Proceeds from cryptocurrency investment scams, but seems to be a separate money laundering network that is not principally Bitfinex, Tether, Alameda Research, or FTX, just to make that explicitly clear. But what this reveals is that Dell Tech is, according to this affidavit, kind of doing a crypto capital corp, where they are opening accounts in one name for one stated purpose and using them for other purposes without mm -hmm. telling banks. And my understanding, again, as a non-lawyer and especially as a non-prosecutor, is that banks don't like it when other banks lie to them. They take that quite poorly. And so if there is going to be other consequences for Dell Tech, I mm. think it is unlikely they arise from this class action lawsuit. I think that this likely results in maybe some money Dell Tech has to give these people, but probably nothing. The more interesting thing to me is that there was this earlier seizure in March through this account that seems to line up with uh, the same type of account that Bitfinex and Tether's funds were flowing uh, from to FTX and Alameda Research. That is the interesting thing to me, and that suggests there may, may be ongoing criminal or other investigations into activities uh, either by Dell Tech or by entities that were taking advantage of Dell Tech practices. You mentioned uh, Mitsubishi UFJ, um, and I know that that's one of the largest banks in the world. So yep. uh, this is, I'm sure, not surprising, but I believe that they were also a bank that was utilized by um, FTX Alameda, yes. right? Yes. I guess there's always been talk of the... The Japan arbitrage, yes. Well, there's always rumors there were different ones, right? No one, it doesn't seem like anyone has ever nailed down exactly what was going on or how it was happening. But yeah, if, if it was indeed the Japan arbitrage and he was actually making money at first, then perhaps... Yeah, who knows? Sure is interesting that they did have bank accounts with MUF, uh, MUFJ. Yeah, that's just interesting. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what it means, but it's very interesting. We should also mention besides that, that's the bigger thing. Just for the sake of completion, I, I want to mention that Farmington State Bank, Moonstone Bank, uh, did file their response. And their, base, their response was basically plaintiffs tried to say we're Dell Tech, we're not Dell Tech. Those texts are about Dell Tech. We're a whole separate bank that just happens to be owned by the same people. Uh, and the executives just happen to be the son of the executives of the other bank. But we're a distinct thing. And uh, we didn't get to do any transfers of FTX or Alameda Research money because we ran out of time. And so we don't want to be in the lawsuit anymore. Again, non-lawyer. But I'll link the thing in the description and you all can read that that's basically what it says. I guess the most compelling argument there is that, yeah, if you 
m mess with other banks, the other banks might punish you, which is ultimately, or something like FINRA or something like that, uh, where ultimately that's far w worse than <laughs> uh, like a penalty or something or a civil suit being settled like far worse to um have banks say you know what we're never going to work with you ever again not that that's what's going to happen we have no idea what's going to happen um or what is happening i mean obviously dell tech is still in business they're still doing their thing i assume that that they still work with with tether but who knows as far as we know anyway we just felt like it was important for us to talk about dell tech because it has it for a long time was one of the main banks of tether for cryptocurrency in general i guess we, more importantly it's funny because like a lot of the banks that tether chooses end up being very important to the cryptocurrency industry in general i don't think they're necessarily their bank of choice anymore but it certainly was for a long time um and maybe we'll start talking about other other important banks in the cryptocurrency industry i know a lot of them are gone now <laughs> Um, but maybe we can look internationally and, and talk about those ones instead.